Hey everyone, let's talk about cloud costs. This video has been on my to-do list forever. Then Fireship dropped that hilarious cloud addiction video, putting the whole cloud trap thing into perspective. And not too long after that, webdev Cody shared his cloud bill horror story after being DDoSed. Both of these videos will be in the description if you want to check them out. They just reaffirmed why this topic needs serious discussion. And not too long after that, webdev Cody shared his cloud bill horror story after being DDoSed. And these videos just reaffirmed why this topic needs serious discussion. My video was sparked by the journey of hosting a simple portfolio website and let's just say it got a little more complicated than I expected so I'll just share my story around that then highlight a few common pitfalls that you should be aware of and after that I can offer some solutions and alternatives let's get started building a solid online presence feels essential these days you never know what opportunities a good portfolio might bring right so I figured it was time to build mine you can check out this video to see exactly how I build the front end for my website I chose Nuxt for a snappy front end, and as you may know, I love Directus as a CMS, which can also use a Postgres database. So everything seems straightforward enough, but hosting all of this, well, that's where things got a bit complicated. I looked at some alternatives to build or host a portfolio website, and then I quickly realized how hard it was to predict cloud costs. Lately, I heard Vercel was the way to go for front end stuff. Unlimited this, free that, all that sounded great until I saw their pricing page. It was just this maze of services. Even with my experience, I was still overwhelmed. And now imagine if you're new to all this. One thing in particular that caught my attention was the Postgres SQL limit on compute time. Their hobby tier comes with a seemingly generous 60 hours of compute per month. However, I could not find a crystal clear definition of what constitutes a compute hour for the database. Is it based on the time a query runs? Does having a connection open count towards these hours? This lack of transparency makes it incredibly tough to predict your actual costs. So you can imagine two scenarios, a low traffic backend, maybe your database powers a small portfolio site or a simple API. If your queries are infrequent, you might just stay within the free tier. A real-time dashboard, constantly polling for updates, doing frequent requests, even if simple, can blow past the 60 hours in no time. And here's what I want you to think honestly. Looking at this price table, would you be able to predict right now, with certainty, how quickly your project might outgrow Vercel's free tier? Can you really say for sure which of these limits you'll hit first, the storage, the requests or the mysterious compute time? Or actually, could you now say how much compute time will your database use for sure? I doubt you'd be able to predict even how much your first month's invoice will be. Next, I thought I could simplify things using a platform such as Supabase. Surely my project should fit in their free tier, right? Well, looking at their pricing page, it seems promising at first. But then I noticed a major catch. They put your database to sleep if it's inactive and you have to enable it manually from the dashboard. Now my portfolio website wouldn't get a ton of traffic. I could realistically have a week with no visitors. Could I really guarantee at least some activity to keep my database awake? Should I create automated scripts just to prevent that? Seems like a hack. Suddenly even the basic availability jumps you into paid tiers. And then there's the storage issue. Their free tier is tiny. Maybe enough for my portfolio, however, a slightly more complex project would easily exceed that limit. It seems likely that this would be the first hurdle forcing you into a pay tier, even if everything else about your project is small scale. And then the next tier is likely to over-provision the database to something you don't really need. So the jump between the two tiers is just too drastic. You pay for more than you need. At this point, I started wondering if these supposedly simple services are really as straightforward as they seem. Next, I looked at platforms like DigitalOcean. In their case, the pricing is at least predictable. First, I checked out their managed database options. The tiers start decently, but balloon quickly with increased performance. A basic database with 1 gig of RAM and 1 CPU core? That's $15. Maybe you just need a bit more RAM, like one more gig? That's already double the price. And it's important to know that 1 gig of RAM and 1 CPU core isn't really a performance database setup, especially for anything beyond a small project. And then the price is for a single node, not a cluster. On the plus side, they do include free backups for seven days, which is a nice touch. I would also need one or two droplets, one to host the Nuxt page itself and another for the direct to CMS. So you're looking at upwards of $20 for a simple website like this. As a side note, this is the website I'm talking about. So if you want to check it out, the link will be in the video description. Now, before looking at the most common pitfalls, let's step back to understand why this happens in the first place. 
One reason I can think of is complexity overload. Cloud providers offer a bazillion services designed for enterprise scenarios. And that's just overkill for many of us. Think of AWS. It starts with wanting a place to host your app, like EC2 maybe, then you need storage, so you add S3, you need a database, you use RDS, maybe a CDN, CloudFront, and that's just before you get into the specialized stuff. It's like peeling an onion. You realize that there are layers upon layers of services, each with its own pricing quirks. The second important factors are the hidden fees. And here you can think of data transfer fees, like weird data egress charges. Ever try to figure out how much would it cost you to move the data out of a cloud provider? It's enough to make you reconsider your life choices and maybe the price of a fast SSD. The nickel and diming here has gotten so bad that the European Union is stepping in. Their new data act aims to ban those ridiculous egress fees, forcing cloud providers to be more transparent. Let's hope it will make a difference. Another important factor in this discussion is vendor lock-in. Ever fallen in love with that shiny cloud exclusive tool? Sure, they feel amazing at first, but good luck migrating away if your costs skyrocket. Cloud service, more like cloud mortgage. Another factor is scalability and security. So as web dev code experienced and highlighted in his video, the cloud isn't a set it and forget it solution. Protection gets insanely expensive during an attack. This is where planning is crucial. If I host something on a server and I get DDoSed, the server goes down, right? If your cloud service gets DDoSed, well, you get a nice $600 invoice the next day. Of course, this depends on the application you're running, whether downtime is better than a blank check but this is surely something you need to take into account. Now let's move on to the most common pitfalls. Understanding pitfalls like this is crucial for avoiding unexpected costs. Here are five of the most common ones I've encountered. Pitfall number one, the illusion of per request pricing. And here I also include charges by rows fetched. Let's say your shiny new cloud database charges you per row fetched. Sounds reasonable, right? But you're just one unoptimized query away. For example, if you're missing an index and suddenly you're scanning thousands upon thousands of rows to get that one row that you need. And now your cheap database just bankrupt you. Also, charges per request. Keep in mind requests are not users. My simple portfolio sees about 1.5k requests for something like 50 unique users. That's because every image, every CSS file and every JavaScript snippet that is sent in chunks is a request. And that's just for a simple portfolio website. For a more dynamic website, the beer stacks up fast. So unless you can predict exactly how every user will interact with the application, estimating your cost at the end of the month is nearly impossible. Pitfall number two, the generous trap. They lure you in with ample free storage or bandwidth, etc. But that one important feature you need, strangely limited, forcing you into a paid upgrade. And of course, that paid upgrade forces you into a package with way more resources than you need. So they almost always over-provision the higher tiers. So here it's important to understand what each item on the pricing page means before you get hooked. Pitfall number three, the cost of escape. Like we talked about, extracting your data out of the cloud, you'll often pay a steep fee for the privilege, especially at scale. Another factor for the cost of escape is vendor lock-in. Proprietary cloud tools may seem amazing at first, but are designed to make switching a nightmare, most likely costing you a small fortune in development time. Pitfall number four, dangerous ignorance. Many developers treat cloud services as magic black boxes. They really don't realize the underlying technologies used, such as Postgres, Nginx, etc., and how this impacts your costs. Imagine unknowingly deploying a database configuration that costs 10 times more than a perfectly suitable alternative. And trust me, this does happen. Another way ignorance plays a role into this is the just pay mentality. Without understanding the fundamentals, developers easily accept inflated prices. But cloud costs are often arbitrary and understanding and questioning the pricing is important. Pitfall number five, I call this one the managed illusion. Managed doesn't mean problem free. However, some developers confuse this with a set it and forget it solution. So developers are often lured into a false sense of security. Many services won't optimize your queries. Indexing, database design, these are still your responsibility. Not understanding this leads to unnecessary costs through inefficient setups and over-reliance on auto-scaling, both of which the cloud providers happily profit from. Automatic backups are also great, but what's your disaster recovery plan? 
how often do you test those backup restores? Like I said earlier, many services can scale automatically, often without you fully realizing it. You still need to monitor usage. Cloud providers do offer monitoring tools, but they often come with their own costs and limitations. So don't assume you're getting accurate oversight for free. Before I go into the solution I use for my portfolio website, please take a moment to subscribe. We're actually very close to 1000 subscribers. I'll wait. So what's the solution I chose for my portfolio website? Does this mean cloud computing is evil? Absolutely not. Neither of the services I mentioned in this video are bad. They just help me illustrate some points and misconceptions. But you really need to be armed with this knowledge the next time you're looking at the pricing table. Here's what ended up working for my portfolio website. For the Nuxt front-end application, I used Cloudflare Workers. It's simple to use and has a generous free tier. Cloudflare also acts as your DNS manager and offers performance optimization and DDoS protections for free. This really seems like a smart strategy on their part. Support smaller projects with potential to grow and they get back word of mouth recommendations. Case in point, I'm talking about their services in my video. For the Directus CMS, my trusty home lab server stepped up. This is where I host Directus and PostgreSQL. To see how I've built my home lab server, check out this video. And yes, electricity costs a bit, but at least my server isn't sending me a surprise invoice. It's a predictable cost and I'm in total control. Fun fact, Postgres is incredibly resource efficient and you can check out this video to see why I use it for most of my projects. I urge you to be strategic about self-hosting. Choose exactly what goes on your servers, for example non-mission critical services, staging environments and so on, and what goes in the cloud or on managed services. For example, I self-host multiple services that use the same database instance, sharing the costs. Plus, I can use the same direct CMS instance to manage content for multiple websites. And for security exposing the services from my home lab, I use Cloudflare Tunnels, a great option for controlled exposure of self-hosted services. And this is again free if you can believe it. So all in all, my websites cost zero dollars and I'm only paying for electricity. When I do use the cloud, however, I scrutinize every component's cost. Wherever possible, I try to use open source tools to break free of vendor locking. And this also gives me some flexibility in the long run. And beyond that, I'm investing time into learning the underlying technologies, things like Kubernetes, cloud native applications, and so on. This means that if I need to, I can migrate or split the workloads between cloud providers or even bring them into my home lab server without major headaches. So please take time to understand what you actually need and shop smartly. Don't be afraid to host it yourself and learn the hard stuff. Trust me, in the long run, it will pay off. Let's keep this conversation going. Drop your cloud pricing horror stories in the comments and let's learn from each other. Maybe your story will help someone else avoid a nasty cloud invoice. Or maybe you think my criticism is unfair. Write me a comment about that. I read all of them. And before you go, don't forget to subscribe. If you aren't subscribed yet, hit the subscribe button and I'll see you in the next one.